Yeah, here we go. Welcome to the May 2021 Downtown Island AUX Meetup. Uh, as all of you know already, uh, our guest for tonight is Greg Bernstein, who's with us. And we'll be talking about uh, his book, Research Practice. I'll introduce him in a moment. Uh, but before we get started, um, you know, we've been saying this all pandemic long, um, but you know, it's been a tough time. It's been a, a crazy transition to go from an in-person meetup to, to being 100% remote. Uh, so from all of us to you, we hope you and your family are, are safe and well through this time. Look forward to being able to meet the folks who are in the Orlando back in person again. And, and we'll definitely try to find a way to continue to keep all the folks who are joining us remote to, to still be able to, to join in our events in the future. So excited to figure out what that looks like in our brave new future. Um, <clears throat> and a bit of housekeeping uh, for our events. Uh, we'd like to remind you that as much as possible, try to have your camera on. Um, and I know there's a lot of reasons why you might need to have your camera off and that's totally fine, but it makes it feel a lot more personal when we can hang out and see each other face to face. And as it says there, you, you might be famous. Uh, we always take screenshots at the end of the meetup and, and post them online afterwards uh, for all the people that are here. Um, if you have questions during the meetup, and this will be a very interactive one with Greg, um, we'll use the raise your hand feature, which is in the participant panel. Um, you can find it several places in Zoom, um, but you can also just paste questions in the chat. There are several of us here that will be helping to moderate and make sure we keep track of wh which questions have been asked. Um, and we'll either, Greg will be able to either answer those uh, from the chat or we'll, we'll feed them as well if people don't feel like speaking up. Um, and then for our Co-organizer group tonight, we have four of our five uh, on board. Abhishek wasn't feeling well tonight, so he's not with us, but uh, the co-organizers of Downtown Land UX are Leah, Wes, uh, Matt, and myself. Uh, feel free to reach out on LinkedIn if you have feedback for the event or have ideas for talks. Um, this is not our meetup, it's yours, and, and we wanna hear from you and how we can keep improving it. And then finally, our mission, which is something we share every time we come together, is that you know, our goal as a, as a group, as a community, is to create opportunities for anyone to learn and share knowledge about the field of user experience. And then uh, we haven't had the opportunity to gather together and have our sponsor, Tech Systems, provide pizza and beer in, a, in quite a while. Um, but uh, when we are back in person, that's, that's something we've enjoyed for since the very beginning over Five, close to four and a half years of downtown Orlando UX, they've been they've been with us and have been a great sponsor. If you're looking to hire, if you're looking for opportunities, uh, they're a great group to be connected with. And then um, I'm very excited to have um, my longtime friend uh, and foremost user experience research expert Greg Bernstein here with us tonight. Um, I had the opportunity to work with Greg at at MailChimp a long time ago. Uh, and since then he's gone on to start research, research practice at several uh, different organizations, including Box and, uh, and now he's at Webflow. Uh, and he just wrote a book about user research, which he's here to tell the story behind and, and answer, <laughs> answer your questions as well, as well. So go ahead and take it away, Greg. Thanks, Jason. I'm gonna start sharing my screen here. Can I get a thumbs up that you see some slides in front of you? All right, uh, thank you very much. Uh, thank you, Wes, Matt, Leah, and Jason for inviting me. Uh, quick story about Jason. On my first day at MailChimp, uh, the company is very small and disorganized and I did not have a pass to get anywhere in our office building, including the bathrooms uh, or you know to get even into the building. And Jason was kind enough to share his with me for two weeks, which is how long it took for me to get a pass. Jason was big hearted and friendly and showed me the ropes and I am forever in his debt. So Jason, to this day, I still tell that story because you're awesome, thank you. Uh, and thank you to everybody for coming out tonight. I really appreciate it. Um, so as Jason mentioned, I published a book about research uh, and what I wanted to do tonight is talk a little bit about why I published this book uh, and what got me to that point. And then uh, that should leave us plenty of times for questions about research, but you know, anything else you want to talk about, like the Orlando Magic or the Orlando Raptors, um, you know, whatever you want to talk about. Uh, or I'm sorry, the Raptors are in Tampa. I had the wrong city. I knew they were somewhere in Florida. Anyway, I will start talking about my book now and not about basketball. Here we go. 
Uh, so before I was a researcher and borrowing Jason's uh, office pass, I was a graphic designer. And I studied journalism and advertising in college. And it wasn't until I got to my senior year that I discovered graphic design. Um, but I knew that was what I wanted to do for a living. Uh, I started freelancing as a designer and I did that for a number of years. And I kind of improvised my way through a graphic design career. Like I never was formally trained. I, I didn't stumble into graphic design until my senior year in college. So I never really knew what I was doing or how things were supposed to work. I just, I had no idea if what I was doing was even remotely right. Uh, and spoiler alert, it was not right. I had no idea what I was doing. Um, I didn't enter into work agreements with clients. I didn't set up payment schedules. Like I didn't know how to market myself. But I had a lot of friends who were in bands and record companies uh, or who were putting out records. They weren't really record companies. They just had money to put out seven inch records, 12 inches. And I knew that that's what I wanted to do. And I just offered my services at first for free. And then through word of mouth, I started designing lots of albums for bands and record companies. And that was my career for a long time. Um, but it wasn't until years into my career as a, as a designer that I came across this book called How to Be a Graphic Designer Without Losing Your Soul by Adrian Shaughnessy. And the book was not about layout or typography. It didn't tell you how to select the right paper or the right typeface or anything. Uh, it told you how to be a professional. Like he told you how to establish billing relationships, how to enter into a contractual agreement. And the way he presented this was through interviews with other designers. Um, it was like an instruction manual for all the things you didn't learn from a Photoshop tutorial uh, or from AIGA meetups. It was really just how to be a professional graphic designer. And I had made a lot of wrong decisions to that point, but finally I had a guide to tell me what I could be doing better. Um, so in 2012, I started as a UX researcher with Jason. Uh, and just like when I was a designer, I felt like I had no idea what I was doing. I had come from uh, academia where I had gotten an MFA in design, and I stumbled again into a career called UX research uh, through grad school. And luckily, I ended up at MailChimp. And again, I, I didn't really know what I was doing from day to day. I knew what my job was. I knew what UX research was. But in terms of actually the practical day-to-day -day aspects of how do you build relationships? How do you, how do you find the right project? How do you figure out which project is most valuable to the business? Um, who do you partner with around the organization? Like, I knew none of this, um, but I did know that like, surely there was a better way to do this. I just had no idea what it was. Um, and I figured things out through a lot of trial and error, mostly through error, uh, but also through studying other researchers. Um, back in 2012, there weren't a ton of UX researchers. Like, God, that was almost a decade ago. But back then, if I spotted somebody who had UX researcher in their job title on LinkedIn or Twitter, like, it was like we were part of a small secret club. I would connect with them on LinkedIn. I'd follow them on Twitter. We would start connecting. I'd set up calls with them. And we would just chat about how they were setting up their teams, how I was trying to set up mine, um, how they picked what to work on or how work was assigned to them. And it was, it was like grad school times 10. Like I learned so much just from those casual conversations. And over the years at both MailChimp and later at Box Media, I ended up taking out more responsibilities. I had hired research teams and I worked across my organizations, um, meaning it wasn't just with a product team or a UX team. I would start working with marketing teams or uh, support teams or even you know, business operations teams. And by this time I'd, I'd written a few blog posts and newsletters and I'd spoken at conferences about my work. And I had this talk that I put together that was just about a practical approach to scaling up research practices. Uh, and the framing of it was, this might not be what's right, this might not be you know, technically correct, but this is what's worked for me in my career and it, it seems to be going okay so far. And a lot of people would come up to me after these conference talks uh, or they'd email me later and they'd say, you know, I have some questions because I'm in a similar position and the, your practical approach really resonated. Uh, I wanna learn more about that. And that would lead to more casual conversations with more researchers. Uh, and what I learned was researchers were hungry for a field guide of sorts to UX research. Um, we needed our version of how to be a graphic designer without losing your soul. 
or our version of Mike Montero's design of the job, which is a more recent version of that. Um, and then like a moron, I decided that I should be the one to write that book about a practical approach to UX research because I am great at making terrible decisions. Um, and so I started by translating that conference talk uh, about setting up practical research at, at MailChimp and Vox uh, into, I, I tried to turn it into a book. And the entire book was filled with lessons on how to set up research at MailChimp and Vox. So you can already see where this is going. The book would not be useful to anybody outside of MailChimp or Vox Media. Um, that, that was the limited audience based on my limited perspective. Uh, so my perspective was definitely not enough, but I still felt like I was onto something. Like there should be a field guide to UX research. Um, I had a handle on being the first researcher at a small to medium business, uh, but I had no idea what that would be like at Google or Facebook or what it's like to do UX research in you know, healthcare, for instance. I just did not know. So I, like a good researcher, prepared a broad list of questions that I was interested in answering. I interviewed a bunch of researchers from a variety of organizations in different industries uh, of different sizes. And on one of these calls, a very smart friend of mine um, said, why not just ask people to write their own answers to your questions instead of interviewing every single person who does UX research? Which again, proved that I sometimes don't make the best decisions, uh, but that, that idea really unlocked this entire project for me. Uh, for this book to be useful to the research community, I needed to include the research community. And so I decided to open, open source the book and I set up a Trello board and I asked a ton of other researchers to sign up and contribute their perspectives, either through essays or if they did want to sit through an interview with me, we could do that. And I ended up organizing the Trello board through uh, the topics that I was most asked about at conferences. So things like, I am a psychologist, I'm interested in becoming a UX researcher, or you know, I am an academic and I'm interested in what research might look like. Uh, topics like how do I build a team because I'm a team of one. Uh, topics like what is the career ladder for a UX researcher. And so I ended up getting contributions from 40 different researchers who wrote essays for this book. And then another 70 or so answered some short answer questions in a survey that I fielded. And at the start of this whole project, I knew two things about this book. Um, one was that for this book to kind of look like what I had in mind, I needed to self-publish it. Uh, there's not a big appetite for books that are compilations or that have you know 40 authors. Usually a publisher, they're willing to take a chance on a book by a single author that they can kind of collaborate with and shape the narrative. And I knew that that was not what this book would be. This book needed to be bigger and have a wider perspective. So I figured I'd, I would just have to publish it myself. Uh, and then I also knew that to make this book comparable to a professional book, I needed to hire an editor. And so I hired Nicole Fenton, who uh, was an editor and content strategist who I was very uh, familiar with. And uh, they also had published, I'm sorry, they had also edited the book, How to Make Sense of Any Mess by Abby Covert, which is one of my favorite books. So I hired Nicole to partner with me on this project and take that giant Trello board of essays and this giant spreadsheet of survey responses and help me turn it into something cohesive. Um, and, and that was the right choice because Nicole was brilliant and the book ended up becoming a book instead of a failed project that I'm not talking to you about. So I would say that part was successful. That was a good decision hiring Nicole. And so this whole project started in May, 2017 and ended in January of this year, which is when it came out. And it ended up being what I had in mind, which is it's the book that tells you what the day-to-day -day of UX research looks like. And the, the structure of the book that we landed on, it reflects my personal journey as a UX researcher. Uh, hitting on the seven themes that kind of capture the chronology of becoming a UX researcher. So I, I'll go quickly through this and then I will stop talking so I can actually answer your questions. But um, the book starts with finding a way in, which is how people end up in this field, whether it's from school or the social sciences, uh, the fine arts like myself, uh, and end up becoming UX researchers. Uh, then there's how do you get started in a new role, which Jason can tell you all about. Like he saw me getting started in a new role at MailChimp, but it tries to demystify 
um, really why an organization would hire a UX researcher in the first place, um, how to assess a job opportunity, what the hiring process might look like. And then, you know, once you have the job, how do you get started and set yourself up for success? Then there's building momentum, which is all the different roles and teams a user researcher might work with. Um, how do you build and navigate relationships within an organization? And the best place within an organization for a researcher to make an impact. Sharing the work is all about, again, how do you share the work? But sharing the work is more than that. It's how do you share that there's even a researcher now within an organization doing this? Um, how do you communicate that you don't have to guess anymore or rely on really old data? How do you show people that there are ways to have more certainty around decisions? Uh, and then how do you share findings around your organization? Then there's questions uh, and essays around how do you expand your practice? So how do you not just hire a team, but build influence so that maybe you're not just working with your product organization, but you're advising your CEO, you're advising your board of directors, you're advising uh, oh, anybody who needs help with research where you're not just confined to the team that brought you in, but you're, you're servicing the entire organization. Then there's the chapter that's probably my favorite, which is about the challenges and the hard parts of user research. Like most researchers are hired after designers and engineers and other people have been hired in. So researchers are often a team of one, which means you don't have anybody to collaborate with or partner with or bounce ideas off of. Um, you're often understaffed and overworked. Uh, you can battle imposter syndrome. Uh, and then it also teaches you how to take a stand or advocate for change or speak up and find your voice and, and ask for what you need. And then the final chapter is about where do researchers go next? Uh, and it's not just about how do you go from a junior to a senior to a, a manager or a principal. Uh, like there's not a lot of vice presidents of research or chief research officers. So a lot of people end up leaving this field because they kind of hit the top of the career ladder and then they have to become a product manager, which I don't mean like that's a terrible thing, but they have to make a move into a different part of an organization or they become a consultant and stop doing research within an organization. So that chapter tries to lay out where people might go next. Um, people have asked me what I didn't expect to find in, in doing this book or what my biggest takeaway from the book is. And for the longest time, I kept struggling with the response because the thing about this field is it's very fluid. It's not a very old field and it's changing by the day. Um, the people who do this work come from different places. They work in radically different team structures. Every team uses an entirely different approach to research. And so like medical doctors go to medical school, lawyers go to law school. People who do my job come from anywhere. Uh, and that diversity and perspectives is our superpower. Every organization, like I said, is totally different. So I think what stood out to me from this book is that every researcher finds a way to adapt to the shape their organization needs them to fill. Uh, and they end up applying their unique perspectives and backgrounds to whatever challenges are in front of them. Um, we help make better interfaces and better products. And I do expect that soon this field will continue to evolve and change. And we won't be hired last within organizations. We might be hired first as a consultant to a CXO or, or a, a CEO. Uh, and so my biggest takeaway is I think that this field will continue to evolve and what it looks like today is not the stopping point. Uh, it's going to keep evolving and what UX research is today is gonna not look like this in the future. I just said that three different ways using different words. Uh, and I chalk that up to it being uh, near my bedtime because I am very tired, but uh, I'm still ready to answer your questions, but that was a very broad overview of my book. Uh, I will stop rambling. I'm going to pause and drink some water and mute myself for a second. So you think about what questions you want to ask me and I'm going to take a sip of water <laughs> and I'll stop sharing my screen. I have taken my sip of water. Any questions? Yeah, I have a question. Oh, that's why you got it. I don't know where that voice came from, but I, I appreciate you jumping in. Feel, feel free to just speak up. Nobody's asking any questions in the chat yet. We'll keep an eye on that as well, but you can, you can go ahead and ask it. 
So like, what's your view on personas? I hear so much misdirection around them, whether they work or not. What do you, what do you think of them? Do you think they actually work? I believe personas are very dangerous because you create a persona and immediately it's out of date, which means you're going to create this persona that will float around your organization for years. People will make copies of it to their Google Drive or their Dropbox, or they'll store it on their local storage. Uh, and they will refer back to it, even though it might no longer represent who users are. So I tend to not advocate for personas only because they have a short shelf life and it might be better to come up with feature personas or come up with uh, maybe uh, archetypes of who might use this feature. Um, but a persona, they just, I've seen it time and again, you create them you want to move on from them and then you find out people are still relying on them to make decisions. So th that is my, my lukewarm take, uh, but it's a strong opinion loosely held. I, I, I'm sure somebody is doing good personas somewhere. All right, it looks like Christian is next. All right. Um, yeah, like, let's say for example, if you're at an organization that's, you know, just implement starting to use UX and is new to the whole process and everything, and you're trying to, uh, you know, I guess, improve some of the practices and whatnot, like what, what advice would you have there as far as like kind of breaking old habits? Uh, you know, I mean, I guess in, in a sense of like communication with, you know, higher ups and things like that. You know, I mean, I'll give you an example of something like, you know, feature requests, which, uh, and um, what focus groups are another big one, I guess, too. And, you know, I've recently read, I think it was like Steve Krug, Nielsen and Norman, and, you know, all the Erica Hall's book, I think, as well, too, talking about, you know, trying to avoid focus groups. And, but I mean, how, how do you, I mean, what kind of advice would you have to, in, a, in an organization that's, you know, done things a certain way for a long time, kind of slowly break in that mold? Because I, you know, any like acute kind of adjustment seems to backfire, you know? Exposure is your, your friend there. And when I, when I mean exposure, I mean, be the person who one partners with your support organization to say, I would like to speak to the users who are uh, maybe our, our frequent uh, critics or um, another place to start is help me understand what the biggest pain points are for our user and then work with your support team if you have one or your social team to reach out to those users. Invite executives, invite colleagues into those calls and just ask them, you know, tell me about how you experienced our product or tell me about the last time you used it. As soon as people within your organization get that exposure to users, they're, they're gonna have a million more questions. It's like, it's like they're blocked up and that unlocks more and more questions. And then they realize like, oh, we should be doing this all the time, either through surveys or through interviews. Uh, the questions will come out of the woodwork and then there's gonna be more demand for research that you didn't anticipate. But uh, exposure is often the thing, like just get people in a room with users uh, or customers and just have them start talking about their experience. Um, like, I know that's very broad advice, but it's surprising to me how many organizations don't have a constant uh, cadence of communication with customers or users. Uh, and so, you know, an executive or, or a, a decision maker might have an idea in mind or want to make a decision. And then you can say to them, well, you know, what are you basing this on? Why don't we go to the source and, and ask them to articulate their perspective on our product? Uh, so I, I think it comes back to exposure, just have that conversation, have as many conversations as you can. Uh, and I know that's very broad. So I, I wanna ask you, Christian, like, is there a follow-up or, or could I go deeper on an angle yeah, there? Yeah, no, I like, I mean, I've definitely, uh, you know, t taken some of that with usability testing and it's worked really well, for example, you know, kind of watching what people do instead of like listening to what they say. But I guess there's, I, you know, the big one's the focus group one that I hear a lot where um, it's that, you know, you're, you're listening I mean, I guess it's viewed as a form of research in a way. I mean, it depends on the moment, but you know, I guess I know there's a lot of um, yeah black on that, but it's like they they view that as like uh, kind of doing the research, I guess. You know, where it might be giving you a wrong uh, incentive or like a you know wrong. It might be misleading, I guess. 
Yeah, it's it's not a part of my toolbox, and I don't right. recommend it. Um, and usually, it's used in market research, but even there, it, you're putting a group of people together where you're, it's not an organic response because somebody will say, oh, I don't like this part of your product or I don't like this about the design. And then somebody who had, that didn't even occur to them, it was never on their mind, they chime in and agree. And so it builds consensus that might be artificial, that might not actually represent what users really think. Uh, they just want to join in on the conversation and say, oh yeah, that's a really good point. I agree with what that person said. Your login page is too hard when they'd never had that thought in their life and it never occurred to them. And so focus groups tend to lead to groupthink and can send you mixed signals about what's really important. So uh, I, I don't ever, ever use them if that tells you anything. Can I follow up on that part when you mentioned cadence uh, of communication with you know, your user or your customer? Could feedback be part of that? I know like one of the things we do in our websites, we have this like feedback button where they can constantly give feedback. Would that be considered like part of that cadence? I think that feedback is valuable and it should be reviewed often, but I think the cadence I'm referring to is, is setting a, a commitment to speak to, you know, four customers or users uh, a week or, you know, a month and dedicating that time to inviting those people into a conversation with you. Uh, and it could be broad questions just to get to know them as customers. It could be focused questions about a feature that you need some more context around, but the cadence itself is dedicating to, hey, no matter what, we're gonna talk to three or four users every week or every month. We're gonna invite everybody in to listen. Um, and, and it's really just setting a, a repeated commitment to doing that. Um, it's something we, we try to do at Webflow since I started it started before I was there, but we try to do observation club, which is every Thursday we invite a new or uh, a customer who actually closed their account in to tell us about their experience. For the new user, it's you know why they picked us and what attracted them to us and what they're doing. For somebody who closed their account, it's you know what do we do wrong and how could we have improved and maybe kept them as a customer. Um, but it's that commitment to continuous education that that's really key there. All right, I think Wes is up next, and then Ricardo after that. Thanks for all that, Greg. Um, you know, one of the things that I think about is I've been at different places where we've outsourced research and um, had some success. Uh, I've also been at places where the designer is the researcher. Uh, I've been at places where the designer is doing research on other people's work. So you're kind of sharing it. And then we, where we also have like a dedicated researcher and you know, your thoughts on how that works. And I'm, I'm specifically interested also in how, a rounded UX designer, how, how can they benefit from you know, maybe participating in research and at what level? Yes, I, I've seen all those scenarios. I've been in all those scenarios. Um, and that's the thing, every organization values research differently. I think when a designer is also in charge of doing research, well, somebody was hired to do a job, right? They were hired to be a designer, which means the research will always be secondary to the primary job of design. Uh, and what I mean is they're not gonna be able to spend a lot of time going deep compared to the time they have to spend creating and delivering what's expected of them for their primary uh, responsibility as of being a designer. Um, now, if the question is, you know, should a designer do research if there's no researcher? Yes, absolutely. But the whole benefit of having a dedicated researcher there is you're not splitting one person across multiple jobs. You're, you're empowering people to do what they were hired to do. Um, like you wouldn't ask an engineer to also do the design um, like those are very different disciplines. I, I mean, they can, but optimally people are doing what they do best, which is the designer designs, the researcher researches. It should all be collaborative. The researcher and the designer uh, should be pairing to understand what questions need to be uh, answered to even come up with what the concept is. Uh, how do we determine what success looks like for a design? Uh, like it should be a partnership, but they should be working in tandem, not, 
not, um, that shouldn't be a job that's split among multiple people is, is how I see it. Uh, I know that didn't quite answer your question, but I think this is a specific skill set. It's valuable. And we're doing a disservice to our work as product people if we are kind of, I was going to say half-assing it, but that's not what it is. It's, it's we're, we're kind of, we're context switching when we all have expertise that we were hired to do, that would be better. <laughs> so, so why not do that instead? Um, right. One note on outsourcing, it does work if the outsourcing is um, something where they, the outsourcing firm, the, the firm that's doing the work doesn't need a ton of context. So we've come up with this prototype. These are the success metrics, please test it for us. That is not something where you need deep product knowledge, but outsourcing uh, ethnographic research or you know, going deep on scenarios or contexts of use, I don't think that's best outsourced. I think that somebody within the organization is, is the person who needs to drive that because they understand who the players are, what their interests are, and then how to share it with the right people in the right format. Uh, outsourcing doesn't get you that fidelity, I don't think. Awesome, thank you. Sure. All right, Ricardo. I'm not sure who's next. Oh. Yeah, Ricardo and then Avery, and then we'll jump to a couple from chat and then Melanie. All right, uh, thank you for uh, for all the insights. It's been uh, uh, really, yeah, really great. Um, so when you're trying to grow the, the UX uh, research practice in, in a larger organization, you know, who are the best people to, to partner with or to, to kind of ally with to, to move that forward, you know, quicker or, or in, a, in a better way? You know, we've seen, I've seen like in different teams, you know, having that ally or having that, you know, higher level person, whether it's somebody in the C-suite or somebody in the VP level, you know, who are those people, you know, and, and, and how can you, you leverage those kind of partnerships uh, to, to move those forward. So I'm going to give you two scenarios that uh, I've found effective. Um, recently, my manager uh, at Webflow, David Hong, he said the magic word for getting headcount is uh, de-risking a project. So we have a bunch of PMs who all are doing uh, very critical projects. There's only one researcher, plus I have a research coordinator uh, working on my team, but I can't be on embedded on multiple projects at once. But these are all risky projects where if we go the wrong way, uh, it could impact the bottom line. So the framing that David recommended I use in asking for headcount to our chief experience officer was, if I had two more researchers, I could de-risk these projects and make sure that we launch the right thing uh, instead of guessing and perhaps launching the wrong thing. Uh, so that's, that's the scenario that I've used at Webflow. Um, I also had that same advice with different language at MailChimp where um, we had a bunch of things we were trying to launch and our COO just said, you know, well, what do we need to, to make sure that we don't hurt the bottom line? Um, so it's really about just de-risking the financial uh, implications of launching the wrong thing. Uh, at Vox Media, that was a smaller organization where we were dependent on ad revenue. So we didn't have a, a ton of, we didn't have like an unlimited bank account. Um, so my secret to getting research there was to start an internship program where I brought in graduate students for six months. And my bet was that after six months, people would be so used to having multiple researchers that they wouldn't wanna go back to not having researchers. And so I was able to transition some of the interns into full-time employees over time. Um, that was my backdoor approach to getting headcount. Um, that, that's, that's also more fun because you're kind of like, I'm going to show these, these colleagues just what they'd be missing uh, you know, if we didn't have research anymore. Uh, they don't want to go back to not having somebody they can rely on to, to answer questions. That's awesome. Thank you. All right, Avery. Hello, Greg, and thank you for your time and, uh, and sharing with us um, tonight. Um, sure. 
So yeah, I, I'm um, part of a software company. It's technically a small, uh, small company. And uh, our team uh, is just now beginning to get serious about like user research and analytics um, and attaching, um, uh, uh, I forget the name of the, uh, the software just jumped out of my head, but, uh, but actually attaching specific analytics and um, acceptance criteria to new decisions. Um, so I was curious, as we continue to grow our user research and analytic practices, how can we begin to use UX research to begin to justify maybe like big shifts in like uh, products architecture? So say maybe you've noticed um, uh, some, some things on the roadmap, like small requests or things like that, that can be maybe all changed or fixed by making like a big adjustment to how your, your product or service might, uh, might, be, might be built. Um, how could you justify possibly using A/B testing to um, to like uh, making that decision? Like if it, if it, if it's relevant to actually use A/B testing for the before uh, before launching, um, and yeah, just kind of things of that nature that like you can kind of flag uh, uh, during the uh, the conceptual uh, pre pre production phase. I mean, I'll be honest; that is not usually my approach to research, but um, it, it is, it doesn't, that doesn't mean anything. It's just not my, my background in it. So um, usually I, I work with a, a separate analytics team that is monitoring, you know, drop-offs or, uh, you know, churn or just uh, dormant accounts to under, they try to, I guess, log through data, what is happening within the product. Um, and that is usually, shared with a PM or a chief experience officer who is weighing that against other signals. I don't usually rely on those myself for making decisions. Um, and, and what I mean is I, I usually rely on, I'll partner with a support organization and ask, you know, where's the most pain? What are the things people are complaining about or asking for? And then I use that as a signal for, is this a new functionality we should consider building? Is this a, simple UX uh, or, or UI change um, that we should consider. Is this just a button where the text is not clear? Uh, I usually use the support feedback, that support feedback or you know social feedback or if there's forums or a community. I tend to rely on those signals to figure out you know, what changes we should make for what we should build. Uh, and it's just because I haven't had to rely on the data when I've, I've had other teams that were doing that and informing decisions, um, I guess, for me uh, or with me. Uh, so I was just one of, of multiple perspectives or, or lenses that people would use uh, to make these decisions on what we should fix or change. Uh, I know that's that's not the answer that you're probably looking for, but uh, that's just my my personal experience in in how we figured out what to work on. Right. Yeah. No. In, in those scenarios, yeah, that makes a lot of sense. And I, I guess I'd wonder. Um, in those cases, would the analytics be used more to, to measure success, like whether those decisions were the correct decision to make or if they actually did improve uh, what, they, what they were meant to improve? Oh, yeah, sorry. That, I could have just said, yes, that, in that case, yes. The, the analytics should tell you, like, are we trying to improve logins? Are we trying to get people to discover this new feature and use it? In that case, the analytics will tell you if, if you're successful. Um, you did mention A-B testing, which... I have mixed feelings about A-B testing. Like, sure, if you want to test something very simple, like, go for it. It doesn't tell you why somebody chose the thing they chose, though. Like, the analytics is the start of the story. Or, I'm sorry, the A-B test, that only tells you part of the story. You still need to perhaps follow up and ask why somebody chose one thing over another. I've also worked with designers who they feel like the job of the designer is to pick the optimal interface or the optimal design based on their knowledge of the product and their knowledge of users. Like why, why make this something that we leave up to a vote, which is basically what A-B testing is versus having an opinion and doing what we feel is right for users. So um, I know that's not what you asked for also, but <laughs> just wanted to add that perspective. Great, thank you very much. question, Avery, sure. <laughs> We'll jump to you in a minute, Melanie. Let me ask one question from the chat. Uh, Arthur asked, what are your thoughts around avoiding the pitfalls of romanticizing decision-making around causation or correlations in your data? 
You want to explain that at all, Arthur? Or? Yeah. What's I could use a little expansion. <laughs> I missed that. Can you, can you, you want to expand on, on your question at all, like uh, some extra context? Yeah. So essentially, it's kind of just saying where, um, kind of kind of to add a little bit to like what you were saying to, to Avery in regards to like if you say 68% of you know customers chose option A versus option B. Um, someone can look at that and say like, oh, well, it's obvious that we need to go with option A. But I guess you pretty much answered it with the previous question where you need to add uh, substance or, or, or qualitative data to confirm mm -hmm. the data that you're seeing. Yeah, exactly. Like the A-B testing only, it tells you what people did, but not why they did it. And so is it just because it was the first thing they saw? Was it because you know it was closer to where their mouse happened to be or their pointer? And so uh, that that's why I think we owe it to ourselves and, and our teammates to investigate. Well, why is this the thing that's happening? Um, I, I it's easy to make a decision based on the the results of the A/B test. And yeah, if sixty seven percent show something, chances are you're not going to make a catastrophic error. But I think it's better, especially if you have a research function in place to do this, to really understand why that is. So uh, I'm a big fan of uh, asking people to record themselves using a product uh, and speaking aloud while they do it. And you know, I'll, the instructions, even if we do it unmoderated, are you know, if you click on something, tell us why you clicked on it. Um, I get so much from that because people will explain like, oh, I, I wasn't sure what this other word meant or uh, the blue really stood out to me. Um, and you get to kind of understand how people are making the decisions they make versus just saying, well, more people clicked on this. Um, so so that's, how I've, that's how I've approached it. Perfect, thank you. Sure. And then one more from the chat, uh, kind of getting kind of the practical side of things. Do you have a preferred method to share findings? Um, Chad Hanson. Yes, I do. Um, hey, Greg, before you, before you answer that, I'm sorry. I, I kind of asked a similar question too, so it, it will overlap, which is why I'm kind of jumping in there with the, what techniques have you seen be successful for stakeholders, developers, POs to embrace informed decisions that are grounded in research? So they're very similar, um, but anyway, sorry to piggyback on your question there, Chad. No, it's one of my favorite questions. So, I mean, it, now I have to say it depends because we're all remote or some of us returning to the office. But um, as Jason can tell you, when I was at MailChimp, we were all within the same office. And when the company was small enough, we all got espresso out of a very fancy espresso machine uh, that at the time felt very extravagant. It was like, ooh, this is like a Silicon Valley perk, but we're in Atlanta, how could this be? Uh, but we would hang posters up at the espresso machine to share research findings. Um, so. Uh, that was that was one way to kind of build interest. Um, or another thing, because we were all in the same place at the same time, was we would do presentations at our, we had a Friday morning coffee hour once a month or once a week, I can't even remember. Um, we, we would talk about findings. We would hire documentary filmmakers to create short films about what we were learning. Because again, um, MailChimp spores on some things, espresso makers and documentary filmmakers. And so we were able to kind of share who our users were through short films. And we had a captive audience because everybody was in the same place at the same time. Now that I've worked remotely since 2016, I share my work much differently, which is I share it everywhere as often as possible in whatever channel I need to. So um, at Vox, we were big on Slack. We had a thousand Slack channels. There was the user research channel. There was the product channel. There was um, the engineering channel. Anytime I interviewed somebody, I would pull out quotes and share some bullet points and I would just share, share, share. And the PMs found it fascinating. The engineers found it fascinating. It would lead to follow-up questions. People would say, hey, this was great. Next time you talk to somebody, could you add this question to your discussion guide? Um, at Webflow, we are creating very short video clips. I'm also using Slack because I think we have 2000 Slack channels. Um, but I also always link back to um, whether it's a Google Doc or a paper doc, um, I always link back to a source of truth where people could read all the bullet points and all the quotes and see all the videos. Uh, 
So really it's just like share however people in your organization take in information, whether it's Slack or Facebook at work or when I was at Signal Messenger, we used Signal, which was not even built for workplace communications, but that's what we used. And so that's where the research ended up. The weird thing about Signal is anybody who joins a channel cannot see previous conversations. So there was no institutional memory, but that was just something we had to deal with. Uh, but yeah, I share in whatever format I have to. I will say though that my new favorite is creating 10 second to one minute video clips where somebody is, they're just saying what is hard or what they love or what they want you to fix. That is more powerful than any Slack message or any document. I'll stop talking now, I've been rambling. No, thanks. That, that's something that I've seen be very successful too, is just those little short clips of maybe not just one person struggling, but like five or six or five yep. or six people loving something. Um, it reminded me of, and I know this isn't really a discussion group, but it reminded me of um, some of the work that we've seen where like, which icon is the best? And you talk about like A-B testing isn't going to get you like the why, but it's like, well, yeah, there's five icons and one stakeholder likes the circle one and one stakeholder likes the square one. And it's like, can they just be informed? Even if they, make, even if they make the wrong decision, whatever that is, at least they made an informed decision based off of some kind of data and said, I don't care what those people say. I just want this. I like the square one. It's like, anyway, yeah. Yeah, the voice of the user is a good tiebreaker or, you know, uh, I guess beacon that stakeholders can then say, well, the users have spoken, we'll just defer to them. All right, Any... Ellen, I think you're up. Oh. Oh, okay. Hello, sorry, I was one of those run people right before the chat, so. <laughs> um, my question is around your transition from design to research. How did you convince people to let you focus on design, or sorry, research instead of design? Um, and as somebody who's kind of helping build out these practices in your organization, do you have any tips for not being the person that is the go-to, but actually kind of um, convincing them that they should hire other UX people and that they shouldn't always rely on their favorite UX person for every single project? <laughs> so the first one, those are two good questions. The first one was, uh, how did I transition from design to research? Um, so I designed albums and stuff for a number of years until I got super burned out on it, but I still love designing. I just didn't love being the person to do the designs. I liked talking to clients and understanding what the goal was and, and how we could help them get there. And I was offered an opportunity to teach design to uh, undergraduate students. and that was awesome because I got to still think deeply about design and, and help people understand how design can solve a problem. I thought I was gonna be a professor for the rest of my life. I went to grad school to get my MFA. And in grad school, I came across this weird book by Luke Robluski called Web Form Design. And it was just like, oh, this is there's this whole thing called UX. And what Luke did was UX research. And like, he's taking design thinking to another level. He is like talking to people and surveying them and, and understanding how do we create the best possible web form? And that was just like, okay, so this is even better than teaching. Like I get to still work as a designer because I'm designing experiences, I'm shaping them, but I'm not actually doing the design work. I'm doing all the stuff that comes before design. Um, so my whole, I'm telling you this because my entire MFA thesis project um, was on UX research. And it was about Apple's terms of service and how anytime you installed Apple software, you got this terrible click up, uh, I'm sorry, this pop-up window that was poorly designed. And my thesis project was on how do we design a better legal agreement when people install software that looks good and matches Apple's brand and is usable and functional and people feel good about it. And that project got noticed um, by some different publications, which inadvertently got me to the attention of MailChimp's UX director who said that thing that you did in grad school, what if you could do that at MailChimp and that was your job, which is UX research. Um, so it was a very privileged and lucky transition. Um, I mean, I, 
I did work hard to become a UX researcher, but the actual transition of um, unemployed graduate student to practicing UX researcher um, was a lot of luck and privilege of, of getting to meet uh, Aaron Walter, who hired me and then um, sat me down next to Jason. <laughs> so, so that was my career path to becoming a UX researcher. Uh, part two of your question was, how do I convince people not to always rely on me and maybe ask other people? I disagree with that notion because I think the UX researcher needs to be the curator of best practices and best, most relevant information. So I do want people coming to me and asking me a bunch of questions, but the thing I'm doing is I'm tracking who is asking and how often. And then I use that as evidence of, hey, we might need another dedicated UX researcher within the organization. Um, so then they're asking me and this other researcher and we are the, I don't wanna say gatekeepers, but we're the curators of the best information. Um, I think that's what you're asking. I hope that's accurate, but if not, I, I will take a follow-up. Yeah, kind of. Um, I am the person who's getting to do the research and the design and the interaction oh, no. design and all of it. Okay, so, you know, yeah. that what you said was exactly, you can't do all of it and do all of it really well. So it was more around the lines of, I can do part of it and I'm happy to be your expert for parts of it, but do you have any recommendations for how to grow when you want to kind of rather than hire on more people that do exactly what you do, but kind of make the recommendation of, oh, I think we need help in this area or we need help in this area to kind of grow the practice. Yeah, I think keeping a list of all the questions you get asked, but also all the ones that you are just unable to answer because you're also designing and doing other things. Um, when you make that list and you show it to your manager or your manager's manager, and you say, these are all the things that we are shipping without answering fundamental questions, that should open the door to at least a part-time researcher. Uh, and I also think if you say like, let's hire a six month researcher on a contract who's embedded, you've put a timeline on it. The risk is like, we'll try this for six months and if it doesn't work out, you know, the contract's over, no harm, no foul. If it does work out, uh, great. You've given them somebody that they can no longer live without and they don't want them to leave. Uh, so that, that's kind of how I think about it. I see chatting, but I don't know if that was for me or somebody else. Oh no, sorry, cool, okay. thanks. That's okay. <laughs> Conversation, um, and before we jump to, I think Ricardo's next, but kind of a follow-up to Melanie, I think a big portion of our community, every time, every meetup we have is either students, boot camp people that are changing uh, careers, uh, a lot of times going into kind of UX generalist roles like what Melanie described, but sometimes wanting to go straight into the research field specifically, what advice do you have for either um, kind of new college grads or career transition folks looking to go specifically into the research side of UX? Oh, if you're asking me, I don't know. <laughs> no, I'm just kidding. Uh, I mean, it, it, there's like a million pathways. Um, one is to, you, ha you have to build up some credibility as a researcher. So one path that I, I've seen a few people do is working with a nonprofit uh, as a volunteer. Um, and I, I like that better than just saying work for free for anybody, because if you're working for a nonprofit as a volunteer, you're doing something in service of an organization that is, you know, hopefully is making a meaningful change and you can help them. Uh, another is finding a mentor. Um, I think there's the ADP list. Is, is a good place for that, but finding a, a mentor who can, I guess, work with you on practicing interviewing, practicing putting discussion guys together and can then vouch for you when you apply for jobs and say, you know, I, I mentored this person, I feel good about their skills, they have um, credibility. Uh, so that, that's another path. Uh, gosh, I don't, I, now I'm drawing a blank, which I think is because we're getting closer to my bedtime, but, uh, I also think that if you can show that you can help a business achieve its goals or help an organization achieve its business goals, like find out what are the, again, find out the things that are the biggest risks and offer pathways for them to get certainty on, uh, on those decisions. So it's, it's not just, I'm a researcher, hire me. It's, you know, 
I'm a researcher and I, I know that, you know, these are the things you're struggling with. These are ways that I can help you come up with answers. Um, it goes back to what I was saying at the start, which is researchers are often the last people hired to an organization. So we have to prove our worth and prove what we can do. And so it means really selling people on how we can not just help their designers or their products, but how do we help them as businesses stay in business, make money, uh, get donations, uh, increase growth, whatever it is, like come in with a plan, uh, send cold emails and say, I can help you. Here's what I can do. Uh, hire me, let's try it out. Hire me for three months. Let's see how this works out. Uh, because these roles are still very rare compared to designer and engineer roles. Uh, it just takes, yeah, it's just harder for researchers. There's, there's no easy pathway. I think that's, that's all I have to say. <laughs> that was a rambly answer. You're getting a lot of rambles tonight. <laughs> kind of jumping off of that question that Jason had, like, I, I think maybe rephrasing it to say more, what are the common threads? I know that there's so many different pathways and so many different types of people that go into UX research and from design or, or psychology or, or whatever, like what are some of the common threads that you've seen in people that have succeeded in the industry or, or you're saying, oh, that's kind of the connecting tissue between all these very different types of people. It's a lot of people who were designers who took on more and more research work until they uh, they couldn't do any more design or research work. They just like they were at capacity. And so they had to make the switch to becoming a researcher or they, they showed that there was so much workload that, that an organization needed to open up that headcount to hire a dedicated researcher. Um, that's the most common pathway is people coming from design, uh, at least from the people who contributed to the book. Um, but then there's also people who they have been uh, in academia. So they are anthropologists, they're ethnographers, uh, they are uh, uh, psychiatrists, I'm sorry, psychologists. They see that maybe instead of teaching, they can actually work and apply those skills uh, for an organization. And that's actually, that's another common pathway because that is a skill set that is a, a direct match for what organizations need, which is people to go deep, uh, people who know how to structure a study, who can pull out the relevant insights. Uh, so I, I guess those are the two most common pathways, a designer who makes the transition or proves the value uh, of opening the headcount or people who come from advanced degrees who have skills that lend themselves to becoming a, a full-time researcher. Yeah. Uh, yeah, those are the two most common. Is, is it more like like a, is, is there an archetype type of person where, you know, they might be, you know, extra curious or? Um, yeah, that's yeah. what it is. It's, yeah. it's people who just keep asking why they're curious. They really just want to dig in and, and get to the heart of, okay, this thing that we're making, why are we making it in the first place? Like, that's usually where every project I've worked on starts like, okay, wait, you keep saying you want to build this thing. Like what, where did this project come from? Okay. Let's really unpack that. Designers who ask that question usually end up becoming pseudo researchers or researchers. Uh, it's just curiosity uh, and, and wanting to go deeper on, on these decisions around what we're doing. Awesome. Thank you. Matt, I think your hand's up. Yeah, maybe this will be a fun one to end on. Um, I just wanted to throw out, uh, I'm very curious about different research methods. And so sort of a two-part question. First, what do you think is the most underrated research method? And second, what is the most obscure research method that you're aware of? Ooh, obscure, that's, that's a tough one. <laughs> I, I mean, as somebody who came from design and was not trained uh, in any way, shape, or form except for on the job, I probably don't know the obscure methods. Um, I'm seeing card sorting become more and more popular. Like that's now, it went from something that was like, whoa, what's this magic, you know, back in 2013. And now it's like pretty common. Um, so, so I guess that's not really obscure anymore. My, I think you asked what my favorite method was. Um, I always am going to want to, oh, sorry, go ahead. 
Oh, no, no. Your favorite's great, too. <laughs> What did you ask? I want to make sure I answer oh, that first. I was going to say, what What do you think is the most underrated? Okay, yeah, underrated. Like, instead of doing anything fancy, like um, like card sorting or uh, usability testing, I will always prefer a 30-minute to 45-minute conversation. Um, if we're curious about something we designed, I will share my screen and have people talk through it with me. And then I'll keep saying, well, when would you use this? Um, tell me about a time that you needed something like this. Like. I just want to hear the details and get that that deep understanding of their scenarios. That that is more valuable to me than anything, and I always push for that. Uh, second to that, I will ask people to just record themselves using our product, speaking aloud. Uh, especially, you know, if you have a product where people are using it around the world, but you don't want to stay up and speak to somebody in Australia, like just give them some homework. Tell them, you know, I'll send you a fifty dollar Amazon gift card record yourself using our product for 30 minutes and just talk the whole time. That the conversational piece is the thing that I will always, uh, I will always vote for. Yeah. I don't know, that, any, anybody here have an obscure research method? Like, I feel like I should know this and I don't. No obscure method. Nope. <laughs> The most obscure one I have is using, I forget what it was called, but essentially it's sort of like a collage where you have a bunch of pictures available to collage like a story and using those pictures as jumping off points for the conversation. Um, and the, the point of it was to leverage it in situations where you're doing research maybe with children or you're doing research with very like emotionally intense topics. Um, but yeah, it was a re really interesting one, but probably That's the most obscure one. I'm aware of. <laughs> okay, Matt, you win most obscure methodology award. <laughs> I, I I collect research methods. It's a it's a mild hobby. <laughs> I need to talk to you. <laughs> well, as as Matt mentioned, we've been going for about an hour now, so uh, I think we'll do the the wrap up slides, and then uh, we'll still save some time for discussion. We'll hang out afterwards. Uh, Greg may jump off. Maybe we'll hang out for a few more minutes to answer more questions. Uh, but let's, uh, let's jump over to some outro stuff. Uh, share my screen. First of all, um, how about a round of applause for Greg? <laughs> Thank you so much for, for joining us tonight and sharing your wisdom and your questions. This was a lot of fun. Thank you for having me. It was, it was a blast. Thanks so much. Um, and then, as always, and I'll hey, go Jason. Ahead. Jason, yep. before you jump to that, okay. um, we want everyone that's uh, attending and anyone that might watch the recording too, to uh, be aware that we thanked Greg a little bit early for his presentation. <laughs> he has something sitting on his desk back there. And if you all want to present or um, be a presenter or speak about something at Do UX, we do have a way to recognize you. Uh, uh, we have, you know, I, an exclusive presenter uh, gift that we'll give you. And we really want to recognize people that are willing to give back to the UX community. So again, thank you, but we wanted to be able to call that out. And I had hoped that you would have waited and opened it in front of all of us, but we're glad that you have it there. It's cool that it's uh, back, back on your table in a nice manner. This is our appeal for speakers. Like it's always, we always love to have uh, people like Greg come and present from outside of Florida, but I know we've got a ton of people in the community who know a lot of things about a lot of different topics. Uh, they could easily give a talk on what they know. And so we'd love to have you share. So yeah, reach out to any of the organizers if you have uh, a talk you wanna share or something you want to talk about, even if there's a topic you want us to cover, but you don't feel like you're the right person to cover it. Uh, we always wanna hear from, from all of you. And uh, with that, uh, I want to do our, and actually I'll go ahead and stop the recording now. Um...